there's something strange about this topic. Um, the divine feminine in Kabbalah and transpersonal psychology. When I was asked to give a keynote this year, at the time, unless my memory was playing tricks, there was supposedly a theme for the conference. And it was going to be the divine feminine. Someone said, that, that, that came through to me from somewhere. So I don't know how it happened. Because I would never have chosen this topic. <laughs> But then, but, but the funny thing is, it, I came across a, a, a quote from Picasso. It's very pretentious to have a quote from Picasso, but I'll say it anyway. He said, the picture is not thought out and determined beforehand. Rather, whilst it is being made, it follows the mobility of thought. That's what happened here. I mean, I'm not making any pretentious comparisons. But uh, that, that I, I set about this topic somewhat in the dark, and as, as, it, as I got involved, it kind of took on its own life, and I hope, and, it, and, and really kind of in an exploratory way, and so I hope you can share with me in that exploration, and I found that uh, it, it led me in directions that I think are particularly interesting. The, the particular origin of my interest here is that the the, the, the flowering of mysticism with Noah's Kabbalah, which really is in the, the 12th and 13th centuries, um, was very much focused on a view of the divine feminine. In Hebrew, the Shekhinah, the feminine presence of God. And, uh, and it becomes a, a, a defining hallmark. And uh, so I, because I'm very interested in Kabbalah, I was always interested in that aspect. But the more I looked into it, and this is what I want to try and share, I was interested in the way in which there was a, a, a general cultural change taking place in that period of time. So much so that um, one of the great writers in the, in the transpersonal area, Richard Tarnas, I think some of you will come across, writing about the passion of the Western mind and really looking at these large-scale cycles, um, looks back to this period and, and, and the period that I will be leading into, which will come across, um, looks back to this period as, as he calls it the birth of the modern self, in particular associated with uh, a Christian Kabbalist in the early Renaissance, Pico, Pico della Mirandola. And, uh, and there's something particularly distinctive in the movements, the, the dimensions of thought that were rising at this period in history. Why that's interesting to me, and as it developed, it took its life of its own, is the parallels that we see in our day. It seems clear to me um, that the, the feminine, I don't mean females, but the feminine, in, in the sort of intrapsychic sense, is very much the fore in the development of transpersonal psychology in many various ways. And I think, and this is what I found interesting, and I hope you found interesting also, that's, that looking to this earlier period leading to the Renaissance, there are interesting parallels which maybe we can learn from as we are, it seems to me, entering a kind of neo-Renaissance in our day. The... The major text of the Kabbalistic tradition is a work called the Zohar, which means splendor, light. And it first circulated in Spain in the 13th century. It, it, it's a fascinating work. It's huge. It takes up that space on, on the bookcase. It makes a, a number of predictions. And two of them I find quite interesting. One, it talks about the sun and the moon. And I'm sure just everyone in this room will be alive to symbolism involved. The sun is the male and the, the, the moon is, is the female, the feminine. And it says that, that the time will come when the moon will shine with the light of the sun. Implying that there will be a time when the, the, the feminine symbolic dimension it comes on the rise. And Another prediction, which I want to read to you, actually. After 600 years of the 6,000th millennium, which actually corresponds to about 1840, there will be opened the gates of wisdom above and the fountains of wisdom below. And this has been considered 
by many in relation to the, the, the increase in knowledge on the back of science taking place from maybe, I mean, going back to science origin is earlier than that, but the 19th century, 20th century, the huge increase in, in, in knowledge. And all those predictions are really connected with an eschatological vision of the, the, the messianic age, the age when, when uh, in our terms, I think, there will be global consciousness, when, uh, when there is a closeness with the divine, etc. However you understand those ideas. And, and really putting it together, what it, what it seems to be, the, the prediction would, would be that, that the, the gender balance, I would see intrapsychic gender balance, changes, and the level of knowledge changes, and the sense of the divine changes. At some point, that looking from the 13th century up to maybe our era. Uh, I'm not a great one. Those who know me, I... I tend not to go for predictions and, what was the guy's name, Nostradamus and all that kind of stuff. Be flaky, you know, you've got to be careful with these things. Um, but I think this notion of a change of the age is one that is interesting. And that's, again, what I want to look at, the, the, the parallel between uh, 13th, 12th, 13th centuries and our day. The, the flowering of Kabbalah at that period has a very erotic core. And I could spend the whole of, of this afternoon, never mind one hour, um, going into detail about that, that eroticism. I don't want to do that. I want to go through it quite quickly uh, because what interests me more, as I hope my introductory words will have clarified, what interests me more is, is the, kind of the, the, the spirit of the age and the changing spirit of the age and as I say, trying to move it to our day. So this is a quick trip through the feminine divine and the Kabbalistic perception of, of Eros in those terms that comes from the 13th, 12th, 13th century. So first point, that Eros is the primary motivation dynamic of creation. The whole creation is understood, obviously, within a religious framework, as the work of God. But the, the process whereby God brings creation to being is described in very explicitly sexual terms. There is a kind of intra-divine erotic dynamic. Um, as part of this, there is large elaboration of the nature of the divine feminine. So, in brief, the, 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 the Shekhinah is seen as a kind of liminal figure, the ruler of the world, the, all kinds of, of symbolic terms are used. Um, uh, the gate of the tent, uh, the link above and below. Uh, quote, at first she is green like a rose. Afterwards a lily, she is red with white colors. Before and after what, you might ask? Well, before and after the intimacy between the male and the female dimensions of God. It's very explicitly described in those ways. The uh, term, the, the palace, the mirror, the great well, a whole host of symbolic terms. Um, so we've already said the, the creation is a process, just as biological creation is, is a process of, of the relation between the genders, so too in the Kabbalist view of the intra-divine realm. And in, in, again, quite explicit ways, human intimacy becomes the, the, the trigger towards the higher level creative process the process which scholars of Kabbalah would call theurgy. That is that human act of action is bringing about some response from the higher realm. And this is connected with the traditional ideas of magic, for example. Um, and even the, the bridging of the domain. So the human male, and it's very important, I'll touch this later, that, that this, this is not a feminine liberation movement. 13th century texts are very sexist, and so let's not misunderstand that. And it's very male-oriented. But nevertheless, for the purposes that I'm talking about here, what's interesting is this notion of a relationship 
between the human and the divine spheres. And that, 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 that relationship described in, in sexual terms between the, the human man and the Shekhinah, uh, so as a sexual counter, or um, through the sublimation. And I wanted actually to begin to just explore these a little with a story dating from this period, which is very transparent. I mean, the symbolism is clear. The princess came out of the bathhouse, and one of the idle people saw her and sighed a deep sigh and said, who would give my wish that I could do with her as I like? And the princess answered and said, that shall come to pass in the graveyard, but not here. When he heard these words, he rejoiced, for he thought that she meant he had to go to the graveyard to wait for her. <laughs> she would come to him, and he would do with her as he liked. But she did not mean this, but wished to say that only there in the graveyard do great and small and young and old, despised and honored, all are equal, but not here. So it was not possible that they should have a relationship. So that man rose and went to the graveyard, and he sat there. His thoughts were connected to her. He always thought of her form. Because of his great longing for her, he removed his thoughts from everything sensual. He put them continually on the form of the woman and her beauty, day and night, all the time. He sat there in the graveyard. He ate, drank, and he, and, and he slept there. He said to himself, if she does not come today, she'll come tomorrow. He did for many days and many years. And as a consequence... His soul was separated from all physical realms, including from that woman herself, and his soul was thought, and thoughts were united with God. After a short time, he desired only the divine intellect, and he became a perfect servant and holy man of God. So his prayer was heard, and all the people came to him because they wanted to receive his blessing, and his fame spread far about. So not a difficult story to interpret. We could interpret it psychoanalytically in, in all kinds of ways, but it's the sublimation. So the, the image of the ideal woman becomes the pathway towards the ideal man. And again, it's this 13th century text is, is clear, it's oriented towards the, the male in that way. What I'm going to do, and I'll keep an eye on the time, but if I start to overrun, I'm sure David will do the right thing. <laughs> um, so I want to flick rather quickly through some texts which exemplify the, the points I've made here. Um, and as I said, I'm doing it quickly because I want to move f further forward to try and draw out the implications that I think are more interesting. But I think we need to have the, the substantial content so we know what was going on in this period, say, 12th, 13th century. So the, the first point, the, the encounter between the male and the feminine dimension of God, it's very difficult, and I thought carefully about these extracts, it's very difficult to convey quickly the ideas in this Kabbalistic, in this Kabbalistic teaching because there is so much complex symbolism involved. It's like you have to enter into the world of it to kind of start unpacking it a little. Central to the symbolism is the Torah, the, the sacred scripture, which for, for, for the Kabbalah is, is not really a book. The, the Torah is, if you like, the world soul. The Torah is the, the sphere of dialogue between the human soul and the transcendent. It's difficult to convey. Come and see. All those engaged in the study of Torah cleave to the Holy One crowned with the crowns of Torah. How much more so those who are engaged in the study of Torah also during the night? So that's the first key term. I'm not just uh, adding one or two elaborations within this, the, the overall symbolism of this system. Study in the night is a clear allusion to Kabbalistic practice. For they are joined to the Shekhinah and they are united as one. Every man who studies Torah at night, again, Kabbalistic practice, uh, is aroused to prepare the house for the king. Such a person participates with her. And in case we weren't quite pulling out the meaning of these texts, so one of the modern scholars of, of Kabbalah, uh, Elliot Wolfson, makes it very explicit, explaining what preparing the house means. 
within the terms of this symbolic uh, storyline. Um, then the imagery of the Shekhinah, which I've alluded to already, um, that the Shekhinah is the emissary, so the, if the king, who obviously is God, or, well, it's all God, the king is the male potency of the divine. If the king, uh, re- it, 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 any interaction between the king and the world and his creation has to take place via the feminine. From, from this lady's house, etc. We'll leave that. Um, the primary dynamic of creation. It's a very, uh, very difficult text um, to, to understand that the process of creation that, that is, a, is a major thing within, within the Kabbalistic world. Again, these 13th century texts are 70% focused on understanding the nature of creation. Why should that be? Well, it's not simply to say, well, you know, what happened? What happened all those years back at the Big Bang? Let's, uh, let's produce our current particle accelerator so we understand the Big Bang. It's what's happening now. So in the Kabbalistic worldview, um, the, cre- the pattern of creation becomes the archetypal pattern of mind and every process within this realm is effectively modelled on the pattern of creation. So that's the reason why a lot of the Kabbalistic material revolves around understanding the, 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 the stages in creation. And of course, the, the, the Bible opens with its story of creation in the beginning, etc. And then we have seven days of creation. So the seven days are, if you like, archetypal stages on the process. But the Kabbalah, is much more interested in what happens before even the first day. And so a great deal of the Kabbalistic speculation is concerned with the, the prime moving of the process of creation. And, and the, 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 the paradox or, or, or the, the tension which these authors are, are, are kind of working with is how do you arrive at something from nothing? Of course, I mean, in a way, that's a still a, a big question for us. And the early texts, and these texts here, are really concerned with, with what happened even before the feminine dimension of God itself was emanated. There is only God. And, and in a way, there's no male and no female. Although being a male-oriented culture, the default position is male, which I think that's something that changes in our era. So the, this, these texts here, the Torah was there as a confidant and his delight playing before him all the time. That's a biblical quote from the book of Pro- Proverbs. And the Kabbalistic material explores that in its sort of autoerotic ways. And if you read this text, basically, uh, the, the, the autoeroticism is explicit. The, the divine is, is uh, it's like water or fire that shakes when the wind blows it. It shines like lightning to the eyes. The Ensof is the infinite essence of the divine, shook in himself. He shone and sparkled from within himself to himself, etc. And this is the, the delight that the primordial age when there is only divine and nothing else, achieves as the the instigation of creation. From that primary initiation, then stages ensue, and the stages take the form of a pattern of male-female potency, and hence the... um, this, the texts such as these. So, uh, and again, I, I'm not drawing out the symbolism. I think everyone in this room can work on the symbolism, Freudian and otherwise, for themselves. The hardened spark begins to engrave engravings in the supernal luster. This is the mystery of creation. The concealed Holy One engraved the graves in the womb of luster, in which the point is inserted, etc. So, 
and, and so the, 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 uh, the sexual imagery, so much so that, that a number of texts from this period and, and slightly later periods say that the, the ultimate secret that the Kabbalah is trying to convey, not just one idea amongst many, but many, but the ultimate secret is the secret of polarity, intra-divine polarity. So this is not, this is not simply, um, as I say, a kind of side story in, in the teachings of mysticism. This is the, the, the focus. Uh, I think... How are we doing time? So we'll look at, look at this one. The, um, again, in classic format, you have a, a biblical quote. So in, this, in, the, in the creation story, a river goes forth from Eden to water the garden, the Garden of Eden. Straightforward. Um, but what the Zohar sees deeper, Freudian, sexual, other meanings within that. Um, so they are found in a state of intimate union. They are never separated from the other. Fountains and stream go forth, etc. So uh, I have gone through that very rapidly. There is, uh, I could quote so many more texts. It's a central theme. And those who've looked at Kabbalistic symbolism at all, you know that the central image is this so-called tree of, of emanation, sephirot as it's called, um, and effectively uniting heaven and earth in some form. And the feminine, the shekhinah, is, is the, the receiver. It receives everything coming from above. But I want to indicate with this slide the, the, the focus of the polarities that the Zohar and other Kabbalistic texts are concerned with. So the male is the, this, this is known as wisdom, and the male and female produce, as was actually in the last quote that I, I, I went through rather quickly, the, the son. So the male and female produce a son, S-O-N, and the son then relates to the female Shekhinah. And that is the essential dynamic of the relation between heaven and earth, as far as the Kabbalah is concerned. I, I, I've also added on here, for those who may have looked at this material, um, some of the, the Hebrew, because the Hebrew letter is actually very interesting. Um, the, the, to, the letter here is like a Y, um, is always associated with the male, um, so, for example, in grammatically, the, 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 in, with the verb that produces a male, te- a male form, uses this letter. The other letter, which is equivalent to the English H, is the feminine. Again, in all of Hebrew grammar, this letter produces the feminine gender. Um, and, of course, they unite, and there's graphic symbolism. This fits into the part there, producing another letter, and this is the letter relating to eight, and there's eight of these principles below it, uh, giving rise to this letter, which is the third letter of the sacred name, which is understood in relation to the sun. And the, again, a parallel between this and this, essentially th- this letter here, which is like a V in English, is simply an elongation of the initial male letter. And then finally, the final letter of the divine name is a repetition of the feminine. So again, all those dynamics are there very simply in in the divine name. And the the, the idea of the image, the the, the, the human is in the image of the divine is, is connected in there as well. So we'll move over that. Uh, I think that's just repeating, really. I don't want to go for... Eros and language is very interesting. Um, Some of you may have come across the work of Steiner. um, Writing, George Steiner, in his book on Babel, very interesting book, writing, Eros and language mesh at every point. 
you may remember one of the earlier extracts, which is talking about the primal engra- engraving, the, the, like a stylus. Again, in Freudian terms, the, 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 there's, a, there's a, lot, a huge element of polarity in the writing implement and the material which is written upon. And, of course, writing... It's not, we're not talking about the 20th century here. Writing and engraving were hugely sacred, te- uh, sacred occupations. Um, and, and so the, 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 the Kabbalah very much is a mysticism of language. But I talked about that on other occasions. I'll just go over this rather quickly. Um, just the point... So we'll just take the second one here. One of these principles in the, the Sefirot, the picture of the tree of principles there, it binds together the upper feminine and the lower feminine, the Shekhinah. Similarly, the tongue is the bond of love through speech between a man and his wife, etc. So again, the eroticism connected with language through the tongue, which has a huge level of symbolism in Kabbalistic thought. I'm going to move it. One of the, very briefly, I mean, I haven't got time really to go into this. What I want to move to consider are the sources of this flowering in the 13th, 12th, 13th centuries. There are earlier sources. One of the very interesting sources for the Kabbalistic imagery comes from the Assyrian period. And it's the Assyrian period when the language, the letters, are first being formulated. Um, and, and here, it's really too small to see, but you can see the, the parallels between the Assyrian. Um, images and the equivalent Kabbalistic images. So there's a Kabbalistic, there's a Syrian, there's a Kabbalistic, Syrian, and so on. But I'm, I'm going to pass over that because we, we'll run out of time. This is really what I want to get to. The, my interest, then, is not simply asking the question, what happened in the 12th and 13th centuries? My interest is to tr- what I call psychohistory to consider what are the movements in our day. And I've already indicated that I think there are parallels between the period I was focusing on then and, and our day. In, this, in, the, in, the, in what I see as the way of psychohistory, what I want to suggest is that in these very interesting epochs, that epoch and also in, in 19th, 20th, 21st centuries, you get an upsurge of psychodynamic material. Um, That upsurge itself brings about a reaction, which is the increase in shadow activity, and hopefully there's some kind of resolution. So I'm comparing the the two periods we've been talking about. And in the 12th to to 16th century, I'm putting there, there was uh, this exaltation of the feminine, um, the, one of the influences. Get the right page. Right. One of the questions that is asked about the uh, Kabbalistic material that I've been talking about is what triggered that level of elaboration of of eros and and the feminine in that way. And most scholars would agree that uh, it was to do with the spirit of the age. Um, In particular, this material first circulated in the south of France. Uh, We have the tradition of the troubadours at that time who were um, exalting uh, the nature of love, courtly love, uh, as a kind of secular side, on the religious side, you're seeing this on the back of the um, cult of Mary, the, the ele- elevation of the status of, of Mary in Christianity to, um, uh, to levels which hadn't been seen before, especially 12th century France, uh, giving rise, for example, to the great cathedrals, Notre Dame. Um, and... There are important differences, which I want to come to as well, that the, what was going on in the Christian world has differences from what was going on in the Jewish world. Uh, but essentially, the, this is what I mean by the exaltation of the, of the feminine. In, in Christianity, the, the, the cult of Mary. In Judaism, the rise of elaborating the ideas of the Shekhinah. Um, 
I want to look... Actually, in a, the last time I gave a, a lecture here, some of you may have been here, I was talking about Freud and um, some of the relationship issues, the relationship with, with, between Christianity and Judaism in that context. I can't repeat all that material, but this, it seems very clear that the rise of feminism in the 19th century, 20th century, has some particular psychological relationship with the, the, the growing interest in unconscious process, the psychodynamic processes. Um, the difference, I said I'd come to the difference, the difference between the Jewish, Jewish world and the Christian world, I've sum, summarized here. So the veneration of Mary involves celibacy, celibacy and the virgin, the idea of the virgin. It's very different in, different in Judaism, as I indicated. More than that, there was no tradition of celibacy in Judaism. And hence, you're getting ideas about the union of the man and the woman is somehow related to the intra-divine union. Also interesting is the fact that Mary is somewhat ambiguously, but theologically at this period, an extra-divine figure. Whereas in Judaism, the Shekhinah is an intra-divine figure. I, I want to just... I said at the beginning, this is sort of exploratory material... But um, I think that what we're seeing there is, is a relationship between the, uh, the psychic world. In other words, the, 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 it's, as, as I said in the previous sessions, the, you know, the, what Freud is doing is unpacking the psychodynamics of the psyche. These are intra-psychic dynamics, just as the Kabbalists are interested in intra-divine dynamics, whereas Christianity is making that dualistic separation, which has, also has implications in psychology. Um, okay, the shadow side. There's a lot of material here. How long have I got? Well, I don't know if we to finish what he is at half past, so you've got loads of time. I'll try. It's up to you really how you want to use Yeah, no, I want to explore this a bit in a bit. As I say, I wanted to go quickly... That's fine. I wanted to go quickly over the, the, the Kabbalistic material... Uh, because the point is easily made. We don't need to repeat the extracts and so on. But I think what is interesting and what I wanted to explore is this notion of psychohistory and, and as it were, the dynamics of a process that is unfolding. Um, and it seems to me that when you look at the period that I was talking about, the 12th, 13th centuries in particular, going through to the early Renaissance, uh, you do see um, a rise of, of what I'm calling shadow activity. Obviously, within Christianity, I put the, the, the first witch hunt date from this period. Uh, I think I don't need to spell that out. I mean, obviously, the demonization of, of the woman. And, um, in fact, I've got some quotes here. As I already implied, I mean, this is not a period of, uh, of feminine liberation. On the contrary. And I just wanted to quote from... This is from Carolyn Walker Bynum. There is little evidence that the popularity of feminine and maternal imagery in the high Middle Ages reflects an increased respect for actual women by men. Those same authors who equate motherhood or the Virgin Mary with compassion and nurture also use woman as a symbol of physical or spiritual weakness, of the flesh, of sin, of inability to bear burdens, or resist temptation. And she's writing about the Christian writings of the period, exactly the same with the, with, with the Jewish writings. Um, this, this, this dichotomy between the status of women in the culture and how the female was venerated in, in the mystical tradition. And obviously, I'm sure I don't need to spell this out, that uh, in drawing parallels to our day, that is one of the big changes, of course. But that's uh, for further exploration. Um, you also, of course, get in this, this period, just, uh, I should say this just before we come back to the, the shadow, the 12th, 13th century, especially in France, is the period of the Great Quest. It's the period, I mean, it's the Holy Grail is written at this time, for example. Uh, the quest of the Holy Grail. It's, the, it's a period, and this is also connected with the troubadours, it's a period in which individuality comes in. The notion of the individual knight on a quest, 
that's new in this, this age. And the Kabbalistic material, as, as the, the Kabbalist on his own quest, parallels that. Um, what's the shadow side? So I'm very interested, and those who've heard me speak before will know this. And again, the, the lecture I gave on Freud two years ago when I was here very much uh, brought this to the fore. I'm very interested in the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. I think, for reasons that are just too much to go into shortly, um, obviously all religions are important. Islam is also important. Of course, the Eastern tradition is absolutely crucial. But there is something about the Western psyche in particular, where the split between what becomes Judaism and what becomes Christianity 2,000 years ago actually has left a kind of a weakness through the, through the collective psyche, of the Western psyche, obviously, I'm talking about. And, and that's something worthy of exploration in its own terms. I've talked about that more, in, as I say, in previous times. That relationship was the... Uh, it manifests as, as, as extreme anti-Semitism. There's a relationship of Christianity to Judaism. There's a relationship of Judaism to Christianity. Christianity to Judaism, the periods we're talking about, were harsh and led to huge suffering, deaths, etc. But the interesting thing to me is that the accusations that were made seem incredibly psycho- psychodynamically active. The great accusations from the Christian host cultures against the Jews were these kind of things here. So, for example, the desecration of the host. There was this idea, um, first in 1243, near Berlin, the first case, the idea that the Jews stole the wafers and injected them in some way which made them turn red with blood. That's bizarre. In fact, modern, modern ideas are that, in fact, this was a bacteriological, yeah, and the reason we can understand in biological terms. But obviously, we're dealing with deep symbolism, symbolism of the blood, the, the, the transmutation of blood and body, and et cetera. And these, these are deeply psychoactive ideas. This was projected on the Jews. In 1298, there was one of these accusations in Rottingen. Uh, 100,000 Jews were killed as a consequence of, the, of that. Uh, and time after time after time, it only came to an end, and I'll, I'll, this will come up on the slide shortly, it only came to an end in 1523 when Luther, it's interesting because those who know the history, he was not exactly a, a, a friend of the Jews, but uh, Luther repudiated the accusation. Another accusation, which I'll put here, is the poisoning of wells. Again, I'm trying to point out the psychodynamic aspect. The well is a source of life. The well, you go down into the depth of the earth to bring out the water of life. These are hugely symbolic ideas. It, it was the time of the Black Death, and the accusation was that the Jews were poisoning the wells. That's what the Black Death was. And again, a huge number of Jews were put to death on consequence of that. The, the, the other one I'm mentioning here is the blood libel. Um, which was, again, psychologically hugely interesting subject. This is the accusation, uh, dating from the 13th century again, that, that the, the Jews um, were, would steal a Christian child, kill it, and drain its blood because they wanted its blood. There were all kinds of reasons why the Christians thought the Jews wanted the blood. I'm not going to go into them all because they're in some ways quite embarrassing. Um, but, of course, the images of Dracula and so on, these all revolve around the same psychodynamic complex. One of the reasons, so the one I will go into, is that it was... It was and these are so f- fantastical that when you talk about them, it seems like you're making it up. But these were real events, and they led to huge numbers of deaths. So the, uh, so the, 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 one of the reasons then was that it was viewed that the, the, the Jews needed the blood of a Christian child in order to make unleavened bread for Passover, which, of course, is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd get that right. <laughs> well, not, not all the time. 
The point again, I, I want to try and pick up on the symbolism. Easter, historically, in the times we're talking about, historically, Easter was the time when most Jews were killed due to riots in, in these kind of things. What is the time of Easter? Easter is the time of the death of Jesus. It is the time of the death and the resurrection. It's a celebration of rising the, 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 from, from, the, from the tomb, etc. The, the core issue of unleavened bread is that it is not risen. Again, it's too much to go into explain. I think probably most people will know about this. The unleavened bread is to do with the exodus from Egypt. It's the time coming out of slavery from a low level to a higher level. But the physicality the, the, the bread, inverted commas, and again, these are psychodynamic and powerful images. Blood, bread, hugely powerful. The bread, by definition, the core ritual feature of the matzah, the unleavened bread, is that it has not risen. So this is a dynamic opposition with the celebration of Easter. I wrote, I, I've written about this actually in relation to the golem tradition, which is... Uh, which we'll leave for now. So you, what I'm saying is this, these are the shadow, this is the shadow material. Um, and how is it resolved? I've already mentioned that Luther put paid to the worst of the accusations in the 16th century. The 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 resolution came about through contact between Christians and Jews. Not just social, general, business, whatever contact, but particularly and specifically, it came about through contact in relation to Kabbalah. And again, I can't, I haven't got the time to explain everything here, but this fellow, Pico de la Merendolo, again quoting from Richard Tarnas, I've got the quote here actually, he says... Thus, the brilliant Pico, 23 years old, gave the, the prophecy. This is Richard Tarnas writing recently. A new form of human being announces itself. Dynamic, creative, multidimensional, protean, unfinished, self-defining and self-creating, infinitely aspiring, set apart from the whole, overseeing the rest of the world with unique sovereignty, centrally poised in the last moments of the old cosmology, to bring forth and enter into the new. That's Pico writing in 1486. One of the crucial, and, he, and this is, he, he wrote this piece, it's from what he called the Oration on the Dignity of Man. And Tarnas is right, I mean, who am I to say, but Tarnas is right that, that this was the defining statement of the, of the Renaissance. This was the defining statement that said, man is an individual on an individual quest. And what were the influences? Well, he, Pico himself lays them out. I can read them out to you, but I'll just, I'll just put it more quickly. Pico was taught Kabbalah by a, a Jewish convert to Christianity. And he sees the, the, the Kabbalistic tradition as, I mean, wrongly, actually, he sees the Kabbalistic tradition as the, um, the continuity from the Egyptian mysteries. And Pico sees it as the way to invigorate and re-enliven the Christian scriptures. And it's through that invigoration that a, a reformulation of what we mean by the human comes about. And that reformulation of what we mean by the human, I think, is really the core of the Renaissance. But again, we could discuss that, I'm sure. Um, so it's that I just brought out that what's really going on is... Mysticism is the core of this. The, the shadow activity revolves around transubstantiation. All these issues relate to that. The blood, the well, and so on. And, of course, the resolution comes through renaissance. In our day, when I say our day, I'm talking 19th to 21st century. One of the, and again, I, I don't think I have time to go into this, but I, I talked about it and I've written about it. One of the core issues when Freud started writing about psychoanalysis one of the key battles he had was over what is the status of unconscious activity. And Freud wanted to say that unconscious activity is mental. It's part of the psyche, the mental life. His attackers, including, for example, Pierre Genet, and actually William James, interestingly, um, held that 
anything we call mental cannot include unconscious. It's very difficult to get our heads around that debate, but it was a core debate. And it's very difficult for us to get our heads around it because actually the debate is so resolved. I don't think there's probably anyone in this room who wouldn't say that the psyche, the mental content, includes unconscious material. But that was the battle that Freud had. Um, where, so I, what I wanted to suggest is, again, Freud, who was Jewish and very, actually quintessentially Jewish in some ways in, in 20th century terms, um, he opens up the sexual nature of the psyche. And the parallels, I don't think I need to point, point to them, they're, they're, they're clear. And as I alluded to before, the interesting point that the, the Shekhinah, the feminine, is an intradivine entity, just as, as far as Freud is concerned, what he's looking at is the, in, the intra-psychic dynamics ruled, ruled by sexuality. And of course, Again, if anyone, I'm sure most people are aware of the, the history of psychoanalysis and, and, the, and, and, of course, it was the sexual theory which Freud clung to tenaciously at huge cost. Uh, separation with Jung, for example. Um, uh, so moving on, again, mysticism, because mysticism today is so much about how we understand unconscious processes. The shadow... Well, maybe we could talk more about this at length, but the, just as, the, the, again, Christian, the Christian Judaism dynamic was critical in the shadow time in the earlier period, so too World War I, World War II comes out of World War I in many, many ways. The, 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 the accusations against the Jews, which of course led to the Holocaust, were the accusations that had been laid by the Christians previously. The, the Nazis were not Christian, but the sources of the virulent attacks that they could produce were in those earlier periods. So you get poisoning of culture, for example, as, po- as a parallel to poisoning the wells. Um, and so psychoanalysis, paralleling transubstantiation, and the resolution. It's very interesting that just as a, a Pico was bringing the, the, sort of the, the Kabbalistic world into the parent culture, which is the Christian culture, Jung, as the disciple of Freud, becomes the person, it seems to me, but we can debate this, Jung becomes the individual who actually sets the seeds for what I call the integration of the psyche. I think Freudian science is very important, but in terms of the transpersonal world, Jung is probably the more important figure although that's another debate. Um, and the, the resolution, it seems to me, I'll put the word Judeanity there, I think there's a kind of resolution of the conflict, um, the, 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 the kind of intense rivalry between religions is not of our day, it's finished. In fact, in many ways, the Holocaust was the full stop on that period. And I would say that the parallel to the birth of the modern self, which occurred as Tarnas rights in the Renaissance, the early Renaissance. So we're talking about the interest in the transpersonal self as the equivalent in our day. And again, let me be clear, I don't think, you know, you go out into the marketplace and start to tell people about transpersonal self, they're not going to greet you with open arms. I mean, it's not as if, it's not as if this is uh, common vernacular. Neither was the modern self, inverted commas, in the 16th century. The fact is, we're talking about psychohistory. And the change that we have today is that there is an openness, it seems to me. There is an openness to the notion of spirituality as not a particular um, uh, institutional form of activity, but it's something that concerns a larger sense of self. And I think that is an idea that has entered, largely entered the, 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 the common cultural pool, the birth of the transpersonal self. And if you want to do a course in conscious and transversal psychology, there it is. So I think it leaves a bit of time for some discussion. Yeah? Okay.
Mm -hmm. I was very taken, not perhaps not central to what you were saying, but when you were looking at the, at the tree of life at, at, at the name of Yahweh. Yes. I've recently been having to teach myself IPA, the National Phonetic Alphabet, and, and what triggered in my mind, you said that the alphabet, uh, two things, uh, was uh, created during the uh, Assyrian period. Right. When, when was that? Uh, the 1500 piece. I've got the dates actually. I don't want to just um, BCE. Yeah, that sort of period. The I mean, it, actually, the, the history of the alphabet is just so fascinating. This was the this. Well, I'll just say though, this was the period when you know when hieroglyphs were being replaced by you know, alphabetic, uh, you know, non hieroglyphic uh, letters. And one of the big influences of that was, of course, the rise of monotheism. Because a hieroglyph is an image. Yes. And, they, and, and they had to get rid of images. It's, I mean, you would never think, when you think, what's monotheism? You know, you think about, I don't know, you know, one God and all that kind of stuff. But you, you, one doesn't realize the impact of that move on, obviously, in this case, the, the, the alphabet. But uh, then the, 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 al the Hebrew alphabet was reformulated in the Babylonian alphabet exile, which, which comes later. There was an early form of the alphabet from the Assyrian period. Right, and then, and then uh, 586 BCE? I think it's 586 BCE, the Jews are exiled to Babylon. And it's very clear that most of the key ideas of Kabbalah are being imbibed during that period. And, and, and that's the time which the modern, when I say modern, I mean the, the square letters, the Hebrew letters, that they are formulated. And, and what seems to me very much the case, you know, people can take it as they will, uh, that, that the, 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 the people who were in exile in Babylon, uh, they, they probably thought, you know, this is the end. We've lost everything. We've lost our country. We've lost our temple. We've lost this. You know, and, and how are we going to preserve these amazing secrets that we've got? And they came up with a genius idea. They put it into the letters. And that's what happened in Babylon. And that was precisely the question I was going to ask you, that I was struck by the elegance Mm -hmm. with which the, the characters that make up Galway came back into digital, whereas the, the, the H is a bit missing the government. Yeah, no, that's right. My, my question was, um, speaking of someone interested in language and in the, in the, in the representation of language, um, was that in, in the production of the alphabet, and what you're implying is that there was the subtext of doing this, that, that it was created uh, from the beginning as a symbol system, not just in the semiotic sense, but as a symbol system in, in religious terms. Is that right? I'll give you an answer by a different route. Okay. I've run, I run a group, and we, we went for something like two, three years, once a week, solely looking at the Hebrew letters. That's all we were looking at, the, 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 the structure of them, the, the letters, the meanings, numbers, all kinds of things. There is so much in there. And there's no doubt in my mind, it's what I said, that... that these guys, whatever guys we're talking about, put it in there. So the answer to your question is yes. I mean, I, you know, I, level upon level upon level of symbolism. And, and, and other dimensions as well. I, you, you do, I was focusing on the polarity notion here. The other thing is, uh, we, when I think it was last time I was here, we had um, Jill Purse doing a workshop on sound, right? The, the sounds of those letters are the sounds that she was working with because they are the archetypal sounds. And... You know, it's in the breath. They are the sounds that work with the breath, and that is the divine name. So, at the same time as it's to do with polarity and, and, and this sort of eros in that sense that we're talking about, it's also the, to do with the the elevation of the of human consciousness. I have to tell you, that's precisely why I've been looking at IPA, exactly, exactly to do that. So, it's come right around to right. what these basic sounds are, the fundamental vowels. Yeah. I quite like consciousness. <laughs> okay. We should talk over dinner. Why? 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 Why would you say elevation of the senses? Okay. Yes. Okay, Mark. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that sort of what you're saying? 
Oh, I, mean, I have no doubt. I mean, you know, all, all cultures, I mean, we can take the Eastern cultures as well in terms of male-female polarity and, and, and the nature of creation and so on. There's no question. There's no question. And I mean, going to tantrism, and all, it, it's the common core of human experience and, and systems of thought in terms of gods and so on cohere around that. There's no question. I, I agree with you completely. What's distinctive with the, the Kabbalistic work is the idea that you maintain that polarity and the importance of that dynamic within, inverted commas, a monotheistic format. So, I mean, one of the real, and it's a very interesting tension within Kabbalah, is when you look at the, the tree of the, and each has got a different divine name, as it were, you know, ten, if you're right, ten principles, you say, well, this isn't monotheism, this is polytheism. But the answer is no, it, it's all within the one essence. But, you know, I mean, that's a difficult one to work with. And, and I think the, the truth is, well, I, this is what I, I would say, is that, you know, creative phases in, in, in history, in, in, in religion and so on, arise through working with these notions of different entities. I mean, if you just simply say, there's one God, that's it, him up there, it, it, it doesn't lead anywhere. I mean, it's okay, you know, it's a simple faith. But the creative phases, and, and the 12th, 13th century, in Judaism as well as others, it was a very creative phase. and was a huge outflowing of poetry and all that, right? Those creative phases come about because there's a recognition of the, in, in this case, intra-divine dynamic. Just like Freud recognizing the intra-psychic dynamic is the source of a lot of creativity. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about. I mean, I don't know. There's a higher teaching. Um, I think it is the it is the teaching, and you know there are many teachings, and, and you know I'm not going to make a hierarchy of teachings. It sounds to me like a higher form, you know, higher teaching. Kind of thing. You, what you well, I think the que- okay. We won't go pursue this, but. But, but the, the, the area of the answer is about, it relates to what I was saying about monotheism and language. The area of the answer to that is, is what does it mean to move from a polytheistic culture to a monotheistic culture? And, and again, I'm not talking about how you worship God, gods, etc. I see it in psychological terms. So, that, you know, it's like subpersonalities. We've got many parts to us. But really, they're all, and that's the birth of the modern self, the notion that there is a self. That, of course, there are lots of parts, but there is a oneness. Yeah. You want the last. You want to get the word in last. I know what you want. A, a cheap trick. Ho. <laughs> oh. My interest is really about the trans uh, cultures, uh, linking back to the, the time you mentioned in history and the language, the secret text uh, that you mentioned. Uh, that remind me of uh, uh, the, the word in Chinese, uh, Ming, uh, which means bride. It was actually. It means. Bride. The bride. The genesis of the word Ming was actually uh, two characters. Left hand side, the sun and the moon, the right. yin and the yang. Uh, so the reunion of the sun yeah. and the moon uh, means bright. You know? So the, 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 the sun and moon reunion, shining bright. Yeah. Somehow, Westman, your, your story, yeah, yeah. your method was fascinating. And in terms of the history, remind me, about, I'm no historian, but my, my naive a memory of the Chinese history that I learned from school in Hong Kong was that, I mean, it's probably around 13th century mentioned. I mean, the word Ming was exactly the meaning of it, was, uh, em- was embraced by the empire and hence formed the Ming, Ming dynasty yeah, yeah. at that time. What, when, what, when are we talking about? Which, which period of time was the well, Ming dynasty? Probably di- similar. Similar I mean, time, it's very interesting. So it would be very interesting to check out the actual lineage yeah. of the history in time. Maybe there's some kind of trans- transpersonal in the new cosmic... It could be that, but also, 
it's very, very interesting. So I agree with you. There was a lot more traveling t- t- took place in that period than we normally think. You know, I mean, we, you know, we tend to think, you know, if you've got a car, you can travel, otherwise you don't. But in that period, there was a, there was a lot, I mean, really on the back of business. Well, exactly, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm sure there were connections. Right, 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 yeah. And throwing some example about about the the shadow intensity, about the the, uh, repression of women would be the example by by the bondage of the the feet of of, of women at that time. Even till today, uh, I mean, the the, the mid-autumn festival, uh, which is mid-August, which is mid-September in the English uh, calendar, is the next Wednesday. Uh, which is my daughter's birthday, but that's really <laughs> Happy birthday. But the, the point was that the, the whole point about the, the politics and the history and the psychology Definitely. Of, 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 of that festival about a moon cake. And, and, that, and, and in the beginning of the festival, was actually there was a message buried in the moon cake. And the message was about uh, uh, turnover, uh, the, the Chang dynasty, and return to the main and right. the revolution. Or, or the Qing dynasty, of course, and, uh, and then come back to the resolution, become uh, the democracy of Xi Jinping, and become now Taiwan, and 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 uh, Mao become the, the modern China of communism. Um, All right. I would go on, but uh, yeah, I no. Question: uh, Your story, with my my own culture. I understand. I don't know, but it's just quite. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. And, and, you know, I mean, obviously I'm focusing on the aspects that I'm interested in, the, you know, Jewish-Christian relationship and that. And I think that's particularly important in terms of the Western psyche. But obviously that, that's historical. I mean, we're living in a different age now. And the, and, and the real update to what I'm saying, you know, when, when I talk about Renaissance in the 14th, 15th century and neo-Renaissance today... One of the key things that, that led to the Renaissance in that time was the rediscovery of different cultures. Uh, Islam, you know, the Islamic philosophers were bringing through the Greek ideas and the, Jew, the uh, Jewish converts were teaching Christians. From Jew- That's how much more so today? That's the point I wanted to make. That, you know, the, the parallel, of course, is, is that today it's, it's global. So, you know, the, the spur to what I would call this near Renaissance today is the encounter of East and West, China and West, and so on. But we must move on, I think. You no, know, no, that's great. That's very interesting. David, do you want to ask us? Uh, well, if I, if I may. Yes, just really a question related to information. When you show one slide in Sephiroth earlier on, mm-hmm. if I understood it properly, you showed that as feminine, but it was still hidden. Yes. And I, I wonder, really, if you could say a little bit more about that, about then the function of that in this transfer from the men. Yeah. That's quite an esoteric question. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall I bring, can I bring the slide back? Uh, oh, it'll take too long. Maybe. Okay, so uh, there's a very strong tradition in Kabbalah that there are ten sifirot, the sifirot are the emanations of God. There are ten, not nine, ten, not eleven. That's a core statement, very deep teaching. Um, Essentially, if you count these that are strong and bold, there are ten. But you're referring to one in here, which I've done a little bit more faintly, right? And that, the Hebrew name is Da'at, which you said, and it means knowledge. And the idea is that in, a, in the initiation of creation, it starts up here, as it were. And there's, so this, if you like, this doesn't yet exist. This only comes to be, into being by the union of these supernal, these are called, referred to as the supernal father and the supernal mother. So these, through their union, 
something else comes into being. At that point, this, which is known as the crown or keta, withdraws. Because you cannot, this is the sort of esoteric idea, there cannot be a connection with the ultimate transcendent when the immanent comes into being. Uh, and it's the dynamic between the imminence and the transcendence of God. So, th- and that's why the... the um, and it's a int- very interesting point, of course, is that knowledge, the, what you're referring to is da'at, which means knowledge, that's the translation. Knowledge is the interface between that transcendent and that imminent dimension. So that's, I think that answers your yeah. question.